What's going on everybody? Dylan with Magical Cams. In this video, I'm going to be showing everybody how I went ahead and made the classic screen enclosures and some other hybrid enclosures into bioactive vivariums. So you might be asking, why do I need to make a video about doing a vivarium in a screen cage or similar if I've already done the other videos? So the thing is with screen cages or partially screen cages, the worry that I had was that the substrate and the leka and all the other goodies that are in the bottoms of these would come out through the screens or come out through the cracks between the aluminum framing. So with that in mind, I went ahead and made what I'm calling a magical bag, which is essentially weed fabric that's sewn together and it's not super high tech so this is something that a lot of people may be able to get behind you know i'm not going to be using some crazy power tools or anything like that that involves a bit of high skill level or know-how if that makes sense the only thing that it will require is for you to know how to do a simple stitch called a blanket stitch and even that can be optional so by sewing this bag's corners together, it really reinforces it so everything stays within it. And eventually, if I need to take those bags out or I need to switch around anything in the bottom of the enclosure, I can go ahead and do that pretty easily by just pulling out the bag. Something else I will add to this is that you will want to think of some sort of drainage solution before doing anything bioactive or doing anything you see in this video. About a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, I went ahead and did a drainage video that you may find useful. There are tons of drainage options and you may have already thought of one that you can do yourself. So the main reason you'll want to have drainage is so that water doesn't start to build up in these bioactive layers, because what will happen is that you'll essentially create a bog, which is gonna completely ruin your bioactive enclosure. So, what I've done with most of these is just made them screen on the bottom. You can make your own screens by getting some frame and some aluminum screen from Home Depot, or you can simply drill holes in the PVC bottoms that most of these enclosures come with. It doesn't need to be something super complex and you can actually achieve this really easily. Something else I will add too is that if you need some sort of tray, like you'll see me using in my video, I actually make some and you can buy them off magicalcams.com or I can make a custom one for you. Just go ahead and shoot me a message. So let's go ahead and get into the video. Hopefully I'm, I'm as descriptive as possible so that any questions that you have will be answered. Alrighty, so getting started, I have some weed fabric here, which is essentially just a little barrier that people will use in gardening so that weeds don't grow up and harm their plants. So. The first enclosures that I'll be doing are the Reptibreeze Extra Larges, which are a 24 by 24 inch footprint. So my plan is to have the bag be about eight inches deep, which would mean that I need eight inch flaps on the front, back, right, and left sides. So after all the math, that would mean I need to make a 40 inch by 40 inch square. So then I go ahead and use a white marker to trace that out on this weed fabric. So instead of just putting this 40 inch by 40 inch piece of fabric in the enclosure and having it look a little bit sloppy and not having it be super stable, what I'm gonna end up doing is cutting out little squares from this 40 by 40 inch piece of fabric. That way when it's in the enclosure, there's not going to be a whole bunch of fabric gathered in the corners of the enclosure. Just stay tuned and that will make a lot more sense here in just a little bit. So just to kind of give you a reference, these squares that I'm cutting out of this piece of fabric are eight inches by eight inches. So here's the dimensions for this magical bag that I'm making for the Reptibreeze XL, obviously it's going to be different for whatever enclosure you're using and it's going to be different depending on how deep you want everything in the bag so just to kind of give you an idea the leka or the false bottom here will be 
about two inches and then I was planning on having about a six inch layer of substrate on top of that, which is the reason that I chose eight inches deep. So now I'm gonna cut these squares out and instead of cutting on the lines, I'm gonna cut a little outside the lines, if that makes sense. I'm gonna be using a really simple stitch to stitch these corners together and having that little extra fabric really aids in having a nice seam. Once those corners were cut out, I then make little miter cuts or 45 degree cuts at each corner of the squares. Now it's time to sew the corners of the bags. You can see here, there's one corner that I already finished just to kind of give you a general idea of what I'll be trying to accomplish and explain. So why go the extra step and sew the bag? Once the leka and the substrate and everything are in the bag and wet and saturated, everything in there is gonna be pretty heavy. So by sewing the bag corners together, it adds a lot of reinforcement so everything stays where it's supposed to. So before you skip ahead in the video and start stomping your feet and saying, Dylan, I don't know how to sew, this is too complex. Just hang on a second, because this stitch is not very complex. This is a blanket stitch and it's fairly simple. And I'm gonna do my best to explain it right here. I know I've kind of made a bad decision with using black on black while recording. So if you can't see or if I don't explain it well, just Google or YouTube blanket stitch and you'll see how simple it is. So one of the reasons I cut on the outside of those drawn lines is so I can see where these two flaps will meet up so that these corners of the bag will be nice and square. And then that little 45 degree miter cut will act as a guide to indicate where the bottom of the bag is while I'm sewing this corner together. So once those drawn lines were lined up, I held them in place with one hand and used my other hand to put some needles along that line to hold that seam in place. Make sure that this first needle's head is oriented in such a way that you can pull it out easily later. When inserting these needles, you'll use that drawn line as a guide to where you want to apply those needles. And then you'll go ahead and put the head of the needle through both parts of the fabric, flip it around, and then have the needle come back out to the side you started on by going through both pieces of fabric again. Once I have that first needle inserted, I then go and flip the bag right side out. And now you can get a general idea of just how the corner of this bag is forming. And you can see here that each side of that seam folds over itself, which is why I decided to cut a little on the outside of those drawn corners of the bag. You can also see how that miter cut at the bottom is really helping to guide me as I flip this bag right side out. Once that bag is flipped right side out, I hold the seam in place with one hand and then use some more sequins or sewing needles to hold that seam in place. After I place all of my needles, I go back to the first needle I placed, which is now on the inside of the bag, take it out and then put it on the outside of the bag so that it will be easily removed once the blanket stitch is completed. Just a little note, Make sure you count the amount of needles that you use to hold the seam together so that you don't have extra needles in the bag once it's completed. To make the blanket stitch, which is gonna hold the seam together, I'm using a large upholstery needle and some leather cord. Instead of just using a basic sewing needle, this upholstery needle has a large eye which accommodates to the size of the leather cord. To ready the thread and the needle, I thread the leather cord through the eye of the needle, pull it around, and for the eight inches that I need to sew, I give myself about a foot and a half so that I don't run out of material. I then snip the cord and then tie a knot where both ends meet. So essentially, you're going to have a piece of cord on either side of the needle. I then start the sewing process at the top of the bag. Obviously, you can start at the bottom. This is just what was most comfortable for me. I start threading the needle about a half inch down from where the seam folds over itself and then push the needle through all layers of the fabric until it comes out the other side. 
it doesn't really matter whether you start a half inch or a quarter inch down from the edge of the seam as long as you're going through all four pieces of the fabric. Since measurements for the bag were taken for the outside of the enclosure, losing a little bit of width here doesn't really matter since the interior of the enclosure is a tidbit smaller. Once inserting the thread into the fabric once, I'm going to go through the starting hole once again. However, this time, I'm not going to pull the thread all the way through quite yet. Before the thread is pulled all the way through, there's going to be a little loop here. And then I'll go ahead and take the needle and thread the needle through the left side and out the right side of that loop. That's going to create the first blanket stitch. For the next stitch, I'll go about 3 eighths to a half inch down from where I previously inserted the needle before and then pull the needle through all four layers of the fabric. And once again, before I pull the thread all the way through, I'm going to have a loop at the end and then I'll feed the needle through the left side and out the right side, creating another blanket stitch. I'll go ahead and pull that stitch tight, but not too tight to where the fabric is scrunching together. And then I'll continue with the same process till I get to the bottom of the bag. Once I get down to the end of the bag and there's no more bag to sew into, I go ahead and complete one last blanket stitch. To finish off the stitching and make sure it stays in place, I now need to tie a knot at the bottom of the bag or at the end of the stitching. I'm gonna take the needle and run it under the last little blanket stitch and then just tie a simple knot by using the needle to thread the thread through itself and then pulling that knot tight. I'll do that process one more time to do a double knot just to make sure everything stays in place as it's supposed to. I then use some scissors to cut off the tails of the thread at both the top and bottoms of the bag. I remove all the needles that I was using to hold the seam in place while I sewed. And now flipping the bag inside out, you can kind of see how this is engineered and what it looks like on the inside versus the outside. Once all four corners of the bag are sewn, this is what the bag should look like. The next step in getting the bioactive process installed into each of the enclosures is something that I've covered in a multitude of other videos. So I'm gonna kind of glaze over everything here. For my barrier layer, I use fiberglass window screen that is cut two inches larger on all sides than the footprint of the cage. Before inserting the magical bags, I make sure that I have a drainage solution. In this case, each of the enclosure's floors are made out of screen, which allows maximum drainage. The water will then drain into a tray underneath the enclosure, and when full, I'll vacuum out that water with a wet dry shop vac. I then insert my false bottom, or my leka, which is just expanded clay balls, and Zoomed sells them, they're called hydro balls. Even though the bottom of the enclosure is screen, allowing max drainage, the leka will help keep water in the substrate. A common misperception people have is that putting something like clay balls or pebbles or gravel at the bottom of substrate will act as a great drainage solution, whereas it actually helps the soil retain water, which is why I'm using it in this case. For these Reptibreeze extra large enclosures, I went ahead and used seven bags of the Zoomed Hydro Balls. Once all the leka was in place, I then inserted the barrier layer, which is that fiberglass screen that I cut just a moment ago. And then I made sure that it folded upward on either side. That way, the substrate layer doesn't fall into the false bottom. And for the substrate layer, I'm using ABG mix. And of course you can make your own or you can buy a commercial one. I will say if you Google a recipe or find a recipe online, it's going to be significantly cheaper to make it than it would be to buy it already made. If I remember correctly, I used a 64 quart tub to mix all of the ingredients together. And to fill that tub, it was about 50 bucks. So yeah, significantly cheaper than buying it pre-made. But anyway, I built the substrate layer up, up until it got to about the top of the bag, which was about six inches of substrate. If you're unsure of how much ABG mix you'll be using, 
there's simple math equations that you can Google that will tell you the volume of the space you're trying to fill. Instead of trying to explain it verbally, I'll go ahead and put up the equation on the screen where you can find the volume in liters for the space you're trying to fill. That way you can kind of get an idea of the amount of ABG mix you'll need to buy or make. Hopefully that uh, little math thing wasn't too complex. I tried, to <laughs> I tried to make it as simple as possible for anybody watching here to uh, kind of get a general idea of what this is going to cost and so on and so forth uh, to build and create. But anyway, I took the plants that were currently in the enclosure and washed their roots off. I strongly suggest that you get off the majority of the soil and some sort of garbage bin and try not to do the entire thing in the sink. <laughs> you will destroy your sink this way. Um, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> Another idea you can do if you don't have those is to just put a bowl underneath where you're washing the roots of the plants off. I then dunk the roots of each plant in some reverse osmosis water to get off all of the nasty tap water. I then repot all the plants with some ABG mix and I mix in some mealworm castings as a organic fertilizer. I really like this stuff and it's worked out really well and the plants seem to really like it. I've always used the mealworm castings in bioactive enclosures because I feel that any of the commercial fertilizers like the miracle Grow and things like that could harm the microfauna, the isopods and springtails living in the substrate layer. From there, I put the plants back in the enclosure and then I focus on planting the bottom of the enclosure. For the plants in the bottom of the enclosure, I washed their roots off too. And then instead of putting them in pots, I obviously put them in the bottom. Whenever washing off the roots of the plants and repotting them or replanting them, the plants may go into shock and kind of wither back a little bit, which is normal. Uh, I just suggest to keep pruning the plants so that the plant isn't focusing on rehabilitating those wilted leaves. Another thing is that a lot of the plants may just die off. And that's kind of the fun of bioactive is to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't and things like that. I typically do not get too crazy with the bottoms of the enclosures here. One being that since these enclosures are super tall, it is quite difficult to have plants grow in the bottom, even with the quad T5 fixtures that I do use. I typically focus on the middle third and the top third of the enclosure since that's where the chameleons will be hanging out. And by the time I make those densely planted, it creates a really shadowy bottom, which hinders plants from really doing too well down there. So if you're the type of person that really wants to do a lot in the bottom, then go for it. But that's just not something that I find worth my time. In addition to any plants I decide to put in the bottom, I'll also use some cork bark as well as some wood and magnolia pods, leaf litter, and then the Arcadia custodian fuel. All of these things work together in providing homes for the isopods and the springtails as well as food. Obviously you don't have to use all of this, just kind of pick and choose what you want to use. Once everything in the bottom of the enclosure was ready to go, I went ahead and put in some springtails and some isopods. And just like that, everything was all done. This is what the two raptor breezes that I did ended up looking like once they were completed. The chameleons in these enclosures really seemed to vibe with the bioactivity and I've seen their mood and behavior drastically improve in a good way. A little tip for success with any bioactive enclosure you might decide to do. You may find it beneficial to prepare the enclosure with all the plants and everything a few months prior to letting any animal loose inside of that enclosure. That way the plants and everything else has time to establish 
Obviously, I didn't have that opportunity here since the animals were already living in the enclosures. This does make things a little more challenging, but not impossible. I let those two enclosures do their thing for about a month to just kind of see how everything fared and see how the bag held up. And I was very pleased with the result. So I went ahead and did the same thing for these two Dragon Strand atriums that Gwydion and Smog are in. So everything here is pretty much the same as before. However, the only difference is the dimensions of the enclosure and then the tapering on the bag that I decided to incorporate. So just like before, this bag was going to be 8 inches deep at its maximum depth. And while I was getting ready to do this, uh, this little psychopath decided to uh, have her way with the project. <laughs> but anyway, I thought someone would enjoy that. Uh, anyway, so once the bag was drawn out, I decided to incorporate the taper. Since I like to make the substrate a little bit shallower in the front to give a better sense of depth to the enclosure, instead of having the bag eight inches deep in the front, I went ahead and tapered that down to six inches. Once the foundation of the bag was drawn out with the eight inch flaps, I then go to the front sides of the left and right flaps and make marks two inches down. Being that the front of the bag will be two inches shorter, that makes the center of the taper half that length or one inch. Knowing that, I then make a marking one inch down at the center of the taper. And once my markings were in place, I then use my straight edge to go ahead and draw that taper. I then apply the taper to the opposite side of the bag using the same method and then reduce the front flap by two inches, which was just as simple as taking off two inches, nothing too complicated there. Once everything was drawn out, I then cut out the bag like before, while still making sure to cut a little outside those corner squares. So I went ahead and sewed up the bag just like you saw previously in this video, inserted the bag into the enclosure, and got all of the bioactive goodies installed. You may recall that earlier I had mentioned that on the Reptibreeds XL enclosures I used 7 bags of the Hydro Balls. This ended up being about $70 of Hydro Balls per enclosure. I found a cheaper alternative through Amazon. These Hydro Balls, or Hydrotin, Leaker, or whatever you want to call them, were a lot larger, and for 50 liters of this stuff, it was about 58 bucks. And just to give you an idea of how much Leaker this is, I was able to use one bag across two Dragon Strand Atriums, as well as the Exoterra Large Extra Tall, which is the 36 1836 enclosure. So in other words, if you decide to buy this stuff off Amazon, you'll get a lot of bang for your buck. While I was furnishing Smoke's enclosure, he decided to go rogue and plot my destruction. Either that, or he was really just trying to get a hornworm out of me. While I was in the middle of furnishing these atriums, my Talansias and my Neoregelia bromeliads came in the mail. After deciding where these plants will go in the enclosure, I'll use some gel super glue to mount them where I want them. I generally will use something that cures quickly, and I'll also spray some water on it since using water accelerates the curing process for this glue. I'm also very careful that the chameleons aren't near these plants when I'm mounting them. I then use some sphagnum moss 
on the basis of these plants to ensure that they'll get enough moisture to stay alive. I use a combination of super glue and floral wire to tack the sphagnum moss in place and also give the Tillandsia or the bromeliad a little stronger of a foundation to work with. When using the floral wire, I just make sure to tuck the cut ends into the sphagnum moss so that nobody gets hurt. 
All right, so that's it. I hope I was as descriptive as possible. I may have glazed over some of the stuff as far as the build of the enclosure because I've done that in other videos. Uh, but if you have any questions, go ahead and reach out and ask me some questions and I'll help you as best I can. On Instagram, it's at MagicalCams. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash MagicalCams. You can reach out via email. That's MagicalCams at gmail.com. And then you can go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below this video. I know I've been really horrible about responding to those comments, so I will make sure to go ahead and take some time to do that and be better about responding to those of you that do comment. Other than that, I've been making some updates to matchfulcams.com. And if you want to go stop by and, you know, leave a review or leave a testimonial or just tell me what you think, that'd be really great. And while you're there, you can go ahead and reserve a Smoke Akasha Baby or an Osiris Belladonna Baby. You can check out what those chameleons look like and the other males in their lineage under the Our Breeders tab on the website. And even if you don't reserve one, just go check it out and tell me what you think. But anyway, thanks for watching the video and good luck on any bioactive vivariums that you decide to create for your critters.